Hey there, Math 237 students, Zach here. In this video, we're going to go over a couple examples involving multivariate limits. I discussed some strategies for handling limits in my last video, so check it out if you need a quick refresher. To start us off, I'd either like to evaluate this nasty looking limit at the origin, if it exists, or prove that the limit in fact doesn't exist. I encourage you at this point to pause the video and try this example for yourself. We'll take up the solution in a moment. All right, folks, how do we do with this question? I'm going to approach this problem just like I would with any multivariate limit problem. I'm going to start by trying to get a sense of what my function is doing as we approach the origin along a few simple paths, maybe through straight lines or even parabolas. The simplest path I can think of to the origin is probably along one of the coordinate axes. So why don't we see what our function is doing as we move to the origin, say, along the y-axis, along the line x equals 0. Along this line, well, our x's are 0, so I have the limit as y tends to 0 of 0 plus 2y cubed, all squared, divided by 0 squared plus 4y to the 6. Throw those 0 terms out and simplify, you should get the limit as y tends to 0 of 4y to the 6 divided by 4y to the 6. Ah, this is 1. Now this isn't a proof that the limit exists, but it does give us some valuable information. It tells us that if our limit exists, it must have a value of 1, right? Either along every path to the origin, our function is approaching a value of 1, in which case that's our limit, or it could be the case that along some other path to the origin, we approach a different value, in which case our limit doesn't exist. Now, rather than attempting to prove that this limit is 1 straight away, I'm instead going to check a few more paths to the origin. Checking paths isn't usually too hard, and if we find two paths that lead us to different values, we can stop. We can say that our limit doesn't exist. Writing down a proof using the squeeze theorem is usually a lot more work, so I'm going to avoid it if I can. Now, we've already checked the limit along the vertical line x equals 0. I can actually check the limit along all other lines through the origin simultaneously by checking a general path y equals mx. That's what I'm going to do. Along the line y equals mx, where here m represents just the slope of the line, it's an arbitrary constant, we get the limit as x tends to 0 of x plus 2 times mx cubed, all squared, divided by x squared plus 4 times mx to the 6. Now this looks pretty gross, but I bet we could simplify it. Since there are so many x's floating around, maybe I could try factoring and cancelling. In particular, in the numerator, I could pull out an x from the brackets, and of course it's going to get squared. So I have the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times 1 plus 2m cubed x squared all squared. And in the denominator, I could also factor out an x squared. Right? I can take out this x squared, leaving me with 1 plus 4m to the 6 x to the 4. When we cancel the common factor, we're left with something that we can actually evaluate by plugging in 0. Right? We throw out the x squareds, and we're simply left with 1 plus 0 squared divided by 1 plus 0, and that gives me a limit of 1. So along every single straight line through the origin, our function is approaching the same value. This may suggest that the limit exists and is equal to 1. Again, it's not a proof, but it may be good evidence. I'm actually going to go ahead and check more paths, though. I'm going to take a look at parabolas through the origin as well. To check the limit along parabolas through the origin, we can again consider a whole class of parabolas all at once. We can consider parabolas y equals mx squared, where m tells us sort of the stretching factor of the parabola. Now, I'm not going to work through all the details one line at a time because it's very similar to the calculation along straight lines through the origin. You can see that when we replace y with mx squared, we're going to have a lot of x's present in our limit. We can factor out x's upstairs and downstairs, cancel them out, and we get a limit we can actually evaluate through substitution. Again, along every one of these curves, we get a limit of 1. Now at this point, you might be saying, come on, Zach, the limit exists. It exists and it's equal to 1, right? Well, we've got some pretty compelling evidence, but this is not a proof. There are still infinitely many curves left to check. I could jump into a proof using the squeeze theorem, but there's one thing I notice here. 
In my function, both upstairs and downstairs, it appears that the exponent on y is always three times that of the exponent on x, right? Here we have a power one, here we have a power three, here we have a power two, here we have a power six. If you notice a pattern like this, a common strategy is to move along a curve that will make the powers line up. In particular, if we move along the curve x equals y cubed, we might be able to combine these terms in an interesting way. Before we jump into a proof, let's check that path specifically. Along the curve x equals y cubed, what's our limit look like? Well, we get the limit as y tends to zero of y cubed plus 2y cubed, all squared, divided by y cubed squared plus 4y to the 6. Let's try to simplify this. We get the limit as y tends to 0 of 3y cubed squared, see how we were able to combine these terms, divided by y to the 6 plus 4y to the 6. Okay, in the numerator we're going to get 9y to the 6, and in the denominator, we get 5y to the 6. Those y's disappear, and our limit is simply 9 fifths. It's not 1. Since we approach the value other than 1 along some path to the origin, we can conclude that our limit doesn't exist. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, for our second example, I have a really gross looking function. I either want to evaluate this limit if it exists, or prove that the limit in fact doesn't exist. Now step one here is don't be scared. I know this looks a little complicated, but we're gonna approach it just like we did the last problem. We're gonna start by checking the limit along a few simple paths to the origin. Now you can start with whatever path you like. I'm gonna go ahead and look at straight lines y equals mx through the origin. Along these lines, along y equals mx, we're gonna get the limit as x goes to zero of x cubed plus two times mx cubed plus two x squared plus two times mx squared <sighs> divided by x squared plus mx squared. Okay, we got a lot of x's here. So just like we did before, maybe we can factor and cancel. Indeed, I can pull out an x squared from the numerator and an x squared from the denominator. This gives me the limit as x goes to zero of x squared times x plus 2m cubed x plus 2 plus 2m squared. And in the denominator, I'm going to have x squared times 1 plus m squared. Now, by canceling that common factor, we end up with a limit that we can actually evaluate through substitution. When we substitute 0 for the remaining x's, we get 0 plus 2m cubed times 0 plus 2 plus 2m squared divided by 1 plus m squared. So we still have m's here. And you might think, well, Zach, this limit now depends on m. It depends on the slope of the line we take to the origin. But does it? Notice that the numerator is really just twice the denominator. This is 2 times 1 plus m squared divided by 1 plus m squared, which gives us a value of 2 for every slope m. Ah, okay, so our function appears to be approaching a value of 2 along every single straight line through the origin. Technically, we haven't checked along the y-axis, right, the vertical line, but I'll let you check that as an exercise. Again, you should get a value of 2. Now at this point, we have some pretty strong evidence that the limit may exist, and our candidate limit is 2. If you're still not convinced, you can try checking along other paths to the origin, such as parabolas or cubics, but in these cases as well, I think you'll find that the function still approaches 2. So at this point, I'm actually going to jump into a proof. I'm going to attempt to prove using the squeeze theorem that our limit exists and is equal to 2. Okay, folks, it's proving time. We want to show that our outputs get really close to a value of 2 when our inputs get really close to the origin. That is, we want to prove that the distance, which we measure using the absolute value, between our outputs and our candidate limit tends to 0 as we move to the origin. And our tool for doing this is the squeeze theorem. 
The idea here is we're going to take this quantity, which by the way, we know is non-negative, right? We're dealing with an absolute value and we're going to show that it's less than or equal to some nicer function bxy. And this function hopefully will have the property that when we send xy to the origin, it goes to zero as well. If we can do that, then essentially we're squeezing this quantity between two things that are very, very close to zero. And so we force this distance to go to zero as well. We have to therefore conclude that this quantity tends to two when we move to the origin. That's the idea behind the squeeze theorem. So the real question is, how do we find this expression bxy? Well, we have some tricks. The first step is to simplify this expression as much as possible. Right now it looks a little messy. We have a difference of two terms. I think we might be able to clean this up if we combine everything into a single fraction. So let me remove this bxy here. I'm going to rewrite this expression as x cubed plus 2y cubed plus 2x squared plus 2y squared divided by x squared plus y squared. I've left the first term alone, but the second term I'm going to put over the same denominator. So I'm going to have minus 2 times x squared plus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared. And of course, we're taking all of this in absolute value. Now at this point, something pretty exciting happens. When we put everything over a common denominator, the numerator simplifies dramatically, right? We get to cancel out all of these terms. So our expression here is really the absolute value of x cubed plus 2y cubed divided by x squared plus y squared. Notice that I've only put the absolute value on the numerator. Absolute values will split up over quotients, so I can separate it, but the denominator is already positive, so there's no need to put an absolute value there. Okay, where do we go from here? Well, ultimately, we want to see what happens to this expression when we send xy to the origin, but we can't just plug in 0, 0. This denominator is screwing everything up. So our goal from here is to try to cancel out that denominator and find an expression that we can evaluate. Currently though, it's a little bit difficult to simplify this further with the absolute value of a sum of two terms. There's really just not much we can do with that. However, we can bring the absolute value into the sum by using an inequality, the triangle inequality. This is one of the main tools that we use when doing one of these proofs. So I'm going to bring the absolute value inside at the cost of an inequality, giving me the absolute value of x cubed plus 2 times the absolute value of y cubed divided by x squared plus y squared. Believe it or not, we're actually pretty close to wrapping up this calculation, but we still haven't cancelled that denominator. My goal is to extract out an x squared plus y squared from the numerator to kill off these terms. I'm going to continue my work on the next slide. Okay, to cancel off this x squared plus y squared, I'm going to try to peel off that same factor in the numerator. Now, I don't have x squared, but I do have x cubed. I guess I could take 1x away to give me an x squared. I could do the same for y. I could write this as the absolute value of x times the absolute value of x squared. Now, of course, that quantity is positive, so I don't need to put absolute value there. Plus 2 times the absolute value of y times, again, y squared. I've dropped the absolute value on this last term, divided by x squared plus y squared. Hmm, wouldn't it be great if we could just factor out these additional terms and leave x squared plus y squared in the numerator? We could if these terms were the same. Unfortunately, they're not. However, we might be able to make them the same by making them a little bit larger, right? Here we have absolute value of x, it's missing 2 times the absolute value of y. But I can add that in to make this term a little bit bigger. I could say this is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of y times x squared. I've just added a positive quantity here, so it's only going to get larger. I could do the same for my next term. Here I have 2 times the absolute value of y, but I'm missing the absolute value of x. So I'm going to add that in. I'm going to say this is less than or equal to absolute value of x plus 2 times absolute value of y times y squared. And in the bottom, we have x squared plus y squared. Ah, a miracle has happened. We can factor out x squared plus y squared. We could write this as 
the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of y times x squared plus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared, and now some stuff cancels out. I'm simply left with the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of y. This, folks, is going to be our function bxy, because after all, it's larger than this expression here, and when we send x and y to the origin, this term goes to zero as well. We've successfully sandwiched this quantity between two things that go to zero. So therefore, according to our squeeze theorem, the limit of this nasty expression as xy tends to the origin really must be equal to two.